Hello, my name is Dr. Jim Doty, and I'm the host of the Into the Magic Shop podcast, where we explore the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Well, everyone, uh, today, uh, you know, my guest is uh, Sadvi G, uh, who many of you know. Uh, we're going to have a nice chat today um, regarding... Uh, religion, spirituality, and uh, also uh, her path to India. And she's uh, told this story actually through a book that was published, I think about a year, a year and a half ago, called Hollywood to the Himalayas, A Journey of Healing and Transformation. So, Sadvi, dear, uh, it's wonderful to see you. So wonderful to be together. Such a joy. Well, uh, perhaps I should give a little background. Uh, we've known each other for uh, many years, and uh, we just uh, actually returned recently from the uh, Council of the Parliament of the World's Religions, where we were on a few panels together and also got to uh, really spend some nice time together. So that was wonderful. So, uh, so one of the things I try to do uh, on this podcast is one, um, make people understand uh, that all of us suffer uh, to some extent, no matter what our position in life. Oftentimes people um, think that those uh, who come from backgrounds of privilege, uh, that uh, somehow uh, if you have either money, position, power, that you are not affected uh, by um, suffering. And unfortunately, uh, so often this uh, is not true whatsoever. And in fact, uh, many individuals who appear to have everything uh, suffer the deepest. And the sad thing about the nature of capitalist society is that there is a narrative that says, if only I had this, and whether the, this is money, whether the, this is power, privilege, there's this feeling that if you just have that, your life is going to be better and you're going to avoid suffering. And so really that's the point of our conversation today. And here you are, uh, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but you're an exalted spiritual leader who's revered by so many people in the world. Yet, uh, at the core, uh, you've had some significant suffering. Yeah. Now, uh, it's funny, uh, just to give a side note. Uh, so, um, at the end of my pool, and this may seem very strange, uh, there is a statue of a Buddha, and it's a headless Buddha, and it's uh, sitting, and it's holding a persimmon. And the reason I mention that is that oftentimes I will uh, meditate in my jacuzzi looking at that statue. But the point is that there are uh, two things that uh, are relevant, I think, uh, to this conversation. The first is the reason, uh, at least in my mind, and it's a modern art sculpture, that the uh, Buddha is headless is to remind me to not get lost in my head. Uh, but the other aspect is the nature of the persimmon fruit. And uh, so often when we suffer, uh, in some ways it's analogous to a persimmon that's not ripe. It's hard and it's bitter. But over time, the realization is that these experiences uh, oftentimes, uh, like a persimmon, become soft and sweet and we're appreciative of them. Obviously, though, uh, that's not the case early on. So in some ways, uh, uh, this is the nature of our journeys. So maybe you can just tell us a little about your background. And as the book says, Hollywood to the Himalayas, tell us about growing up and some of the experiences you had and the path towards um, where you're at today. Sure, Jim. And it's it's so beautiful again to be with you and to be here with your community. And it was such a joy to be with you recently at the parliament. 
I love the idea of this statue in your in your backyard because yeah, pain is that that catalyst to so much growth. You know, in in Buddhism, staying with the analogy of the Buddha for just a moment, they speak a lot about the second arrow, the first arrow and the second arrow. The first arrow, of course, being whatever it is that causes us pain, whether it's quite literally falling down and breaking your leg or skinning your knee or being betrayed, being harmed, being cheated on, being lied to, whatever it may be, physical, emotional, mental, on any level, that first arrow is the actual act of injury. But the second arrow is where suffering comes in. Because the second arrow is this sense of the story that we tell ourselves along with it. Oh my God, why me who had to fall down today? Today was the day that I was getting interviewed for this job of my dreams. And if I just hadn't fallen down, I would have made it on time to the interview. I would have gotten the job and everything would be perfect. So your broken bone eventually heals, the skinned knee heals. But that story of the second arrow of it always happens to me, this is the story of my life, it's not fair, I'll never become anything. See, I'm the type of person who on the biggest day of my life falls down, hurts myself, it doesn't happen. And what I've noticed for me on a personal level is that that first arrow that I suffered was very real pain. I, in early childhood, had been severely sexually abused. I was then abandoned by my biological father. And all of this happened before the age of 10. And you can imagine the traumatic repercussions of that as an adolescent and young woman in my early 20s, I suffered from depression and anxiety and abandonment issues and a severe eating disorder. And I told myself a lot of stories about myself, about how I was a victim, about how I was not good enough, about how I was unworthy. And that second arrow, you know, from a medical perspective, which you know so well, the cells of my physical body, the cells that had been actually abused and harmed, had long since regenerated by the time I found myself in, you know, a hospital with tubes and IVs because I was so severely bulimic that they thought I was going to die. There was no longer a cell of my body that I could show you and say, this is the part that was abused. And yet, I carried that story. I carried that suffering with me for a couple of decades. And that's really what led to to so much of what I struggled with, to the eating disorder, to the depression, to the anxiety, to the constant sense of running after more and more. And, you know, as you as you began by saying that our culture keeps telling us, if I just had this or could do that, I would be happy. And for me, it wasn't so much about the accumulation of material wealth because I had been raised in a family of great privilege, great opportunity, great prosperity. So I had seen all of that. So I didn't have that internal yearning for more and more things or money. But I had a very distinct sense of if I just achieve this, 
attain that, if I just can prove this, get this degree, get this title, if I can just get into Stanford, if I can just graduate with A's, if I can just get into this PhD program, if I can just be the top of my class, then finally, I will be able to prove to the universe, to myself, that I'm good enough that I deserve on some level to occupy my place here on planet Earth. And I think that's something that so many of us struggle with is that that sense of really diminished self-worth based on all the ways that we feel we're lacking. And for me, it was because of the abuse. It was because of the abandonment. But we all have our own, our own story of where that sense comes from why we feel like we are not good enough, smart enough, worthy enough, lovable enough, you know, driven enough, whatever it may be. And that was how I was living up until the age of 25. And by 25, I actually had gotten to a point where I was really successfully managing my life, meaning... Well <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we need to decide yes. what's successful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In my, in my mind, in my mind, with my definition of success, I was successfully managing my life, meaning I was getting straight A's in my PhD program. I had my food and my meals under control. I had my relationships under control. I was married and was able to to navigate the emotional struggles of that, I felt like I was successfully, again, in a very, very narrow definition of success, but I felt like I was successfully navigating my life. And that was really what I thought at the time the highest goal was. I mean, when I looked around me, what I saw was people who were managing their lives and some were managing them well, some were not managing them so well. But no one ever had said to me, Jim, hey, you know what? There's something else. Hey, you know what? That story you tell yourself, that story that drives you to keep achieving and achieving and achieving to prove your worthiness, that isn't actually a true story. That isn't actually who you are. And hey, guess what? There's a, a beautiful place beyond managing your life. And it's called freedom. And you can actually be free of not only the initial pain, but also of this second arrow of suffering. You can be free. Of all of that, all of the repercussions of that which has happened, you can be free of the identity. And that was something I discovered only when I went to India at 25 on a trip that, as embarrassing as it is to admit now, 27 years later, September, just this month will be 27 years from when I went to India. And as embarrassing as, as it is to admit this, I was not even on a spiritual path. I didn't know there was something to search for, seek for, yearn for on a spiritual level. I didn't know anybody who was spiritual. It wasn't the way I had been raised. I was an academic, a scientist, and someone excelling at that. And it never occurred to me that there was a whole other world out there but I went to India with a backpack on an adventure trip because my husband was on a spiritual path and he very much wanted to go. And I was a very, very strict vegan, still am, and had struggled a lot traveling in Europe, traveling in South America, even traveling across the US 30 years ago. And I knew one thing, I knew that in India, Vegetarian meant vegetarian. You didn't have to ask twice. And so I knew that at least I would be able to eat happily on the trip. 
so I agreed, I agreed to go. And, you know, as embarrassing as it is to admit that, yeah, hey, I went for the food. <laughs> I got, I got <laughs> all of this, all of this beautiful spiritual wisdom and awakening and experiences. And yet I didn't even know that that's what I was going for. It, it happened because of grace and that's that's the beauty of the story was just i stood on the banks of the ganga river the ganges river in rishikesh and had this experience of being in the presence of the divine and it just happened spontaneously suddenly as i looked out over this sacred river i was some immediately embraced by surrounded by filled by this presence, this infinite presence, indivisible presence. I mean, it was me. It was everything else. There was no distinction between me and everything. And it was all divine. And it knocked me to the ground in tears of knowing I've come home. Let me just uh, interject a couple of things here. And yes. For so many people... Um, they believe the story they tell themselves. And uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, and they say it over and over again. And as you know, uh, on some level, if you're trying to manifest something and you repeat it enough, uh, and perhaps we're seeing this in our political discussions, that uh, that belief, uh, uh, in your mind at least, uh, becomes uh, reality. But what's interesting is uh, whether it's a situation like yours, uh, anytime there is an injury or trauma, the interesting thing, though, is that it's your choice how you react to the trauma. And people don't appreciate that because they have these overwhelming emotions. And uh, then, unfortunately, that gets embedded in their narrative and it's hard to push aside far after the event is over. And what people don't appreciate so often is that an event has no valence. It's neither good nor neg or bad. It just is. And it is our choice how we experience that emotion. And uh, for so many people, then that narrative becomes a negative one uh, when they've been hurt or experienced pain or trauma. So I think it's important to note because so many people, they don't feel that they ha have agency over their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, what so often happens is that based on those continued narratives, and you gave some great examples of I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, et cetera, then that becomes their uh, reality. So I just wanted to emphasize, though, that so many of us give away our agency and then feel we have no control, and then we, uh, uh, in some ways, become like a tumbleweed that's uh, blown by an ill wind, uh, and we go off in all these different directions, uh, yet at the end of the day, uh, we do have power, and it's actually extraordinary power. We just have to finally see that. So I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. It, it's a very, very important point. And the power comes not in rejecting the story, not in denying it, not in repressing it, not in suppressing it, because the event happened, as you said. It has no objective value in terms of positive or negative, and yet we imbue it with that. We fill it with that sense of our story, which has a very distinct, typically negative tone to it. But then that takes on a reality of its own. That becomes a story now that isn't just something that I tell myself in my head, but that actually fills my sense of fills my sense of being. You feel it in your body. I mean, I I was a yoga student from back when I was an undergrad at Stanford, and I remember 
bursting into tears in Shavasana, bursting into tears and other asanas that somehow would evoke from within my body the emotions, the memories of the abuse. And so that story becomes really pernicious and really pervasive throughout every aspect of the body, mind, spirit, oneness. And that's where, for me, the real power came in forgiveness. That it wasn't a matter of simply, you know, almost 20 years since the trauma had happened, telling myself, oh, just tell yourself a new story. I had to actually let go of the old one first. It's not something that you can just suddenly decide, I'm going to ignore it or repress it or deny it. That's where you end up with spiritual bypass. It's where you end up with repression and suppression and we know how well those go. Um, <laughs> check out your friendly neighborhood <laughs> volcano. <laughs> it, it worked for me for twenty years. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we know we know how volcanoes work. Yes. So that's where the forgiveness for me is where the power came in and the letting go. That it's a very conscious act of yes, this happened. Yes, this now resides in me. And yet, it isn't me, and therefore, I can remove it from me. I can quite literally take it out of me and give it back to the universe. And that's exactly what I was told to do when I first met the beautiful spiritual master who would later become my guru, but at the time, I had just met him and didn't even know that he was one of you know, the world's most beloved and revered spiritual masters. When I first met Pooja Swamiji, he said, I asked him about fear because everybody had questions to ask and I felt like I should have a question to ask. So fear was something that always really dominated my life. I lived in stress. I was constantly stressed, constantly worried about everything. Had I left the coffee pot on? Was the front door locked? Um, was I going to fail the exam today? You know, did my husband still love me? Was the fact that he was 10 minutes late, did that mean that he was, you know, dead on the freeway somewhere or having an affair? Or, I mean, just my whole life was filled with a tendency toward stress, a tendency toward fear, a tendency toward tension. And so I asked, Swamiji about this. And he said, you fear because you don't trust. And I then told him my story. Here's why I don't trust. Here's what has happened to me. And I was 25 at the time, and it was a story that up until that day had gotten me great sympathy. And it wasn't a story I shared with very many, but all of my therapists, psychiatrists, doctors, nurses, I mean, everybody in hospitals, in treatment centers, everyone I worked with, everyone's response to it was basically, oh, oh, oh you poor thing, you know, let me, let me, you know, hug you and pat you and help you. And Swamiji instead, he looked at me and he said, are you going to take that to the grave with you? And I was like, no, God, of course not. I mean, the grave seemed God knows how far away. And he said, so are you going to let it go on your deathbed? Maybe a week before you die? Maybe a month before you die? Now, remember, I was only 25. And I, I said, God, no, Swamiji, I... I'm in process. I'm working on it. I eventually, eventually, I will let it go. And he looked at me and he said, you're waiting for someone to draw the line. You're waiting for someone to come in and tell you that you can be done. He said, no one will. You can either carry this to your grave 
You can let it go on your deathbed or you can let it go tonight. And I remember thinking, my God, tonight? And he said, yes, tonight. We have this beautiful, beautiful ceremony called the Arthi, this light ceremony on the banks of the river. And he said, and after the ceremony, I want you to go and I want you to stand in this sacred river, in the waters of the mother goddess Ganga. You know, the Ganges River is worshipped as the mother goddess. And I want you to stand in that river. And I want you to pull all of your pain, all of your anger, and I want you to offer it. Offer it to the river. Offer it to the mother goddess. And I want you to forgive him. I want you to stand there until you can forgive him. Just pull all the pain, all the anger, offer it and forgive him and let it go. And I of course thought there is no way that a river is going to sweep away my trauma. There's no way a river is going to sweep away my PTSD. There's no way for any of this. I mean, I was a, you know, psychology PhD student. We don't, we don't just dump our troubles in a river. (laughs) There's, there's, there's processes for all of this. And So I didn't think it would work. In fact, I was pretty sure there was no chance it was going to work. But out of respect for this revered master who had suggested this to me, and out of a commitment to living sincerely, I simply said, okay, I'm going to do this sincerely. I know it won't work. But nonetheless, I'm not going to keep mocking it. I will give it the respect and the sincerity that it deserves. And so I stood in the river and I prayed and I cried and prayed and cried and prayed and cried and prayed and cried and prayed and cried and 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 dug within me for every memory that I could find. Everything within me I could find of pain, of anger, of fear, of loss, of yearning, everything associated with that abuse, that abandonment. And I offered it. I offered it. I held the water in my hands and I offered it into the water and then I offered the water back into the river. And I stood there until I could actually see see my biological father's face in my mind's eye and say, I forgive you. And that day was almost 27 years ago now. And what I can tell you is that contrary to everything I had previously thought, it actually works. When we are ready, to be free, we can. And it doesn't have to necessarily be in the waters of the the goddess river in Rishikesh, India. It can be an ocean. It can be a lake. It can be a river, a stream, wherever you are. It can be the soil, the base of the tree in your backyard or a tree in a forest that you love. But that opportunity to give back to the universe that which isn't me but i've taken in as me that i've adopted as me and have come to identify as me we can let it go and for me that's been the most extraordinary power is in the awareness that we don't forgive because what someone did is okay. You know, a lot of us don't forgive because we think, well, that means that I'm condoning on some level what that person did or that I'm somehow absolving them. We are not. We are not the karmic police. People are going to get their karmic dues regardless of whether you carry your grudge to the grave or you forgive them tomorrow. That has nothing to do with their karmic journey. 
But we forgive because we deserve to be free, regardless of what's happened to us, regardless of what anyone may have done to us. We deserve to be free. And holding on is actually that which blocks us from our birthright of freedom. And when I was able to realize that and to let go, the whole identity drifted away. And suddenly I no longer was the victim of this, the victim of that. And along with that, the bulimia drifted away. I mean, it's like it all was part of this package of an identity, a story that I had held and that I was able to offer back to the universe. You know, it's it's interesting in Jungian philosophy, of course, uh, uh, this is often called the shadow, and it's the, the burden that we carry with us. And uh, unfortunately for some people, it, it, and it was interesting how you gave the example of all these people when you would share your story, uh, they would go, oh, that's so horrible. And then it serves uh, in a way um, for you to get what you think is helping or helpful to you, uh, but in fact uh, is not. Oftentimes, and I can certainly tell you from my own experience, um, trying to suppress that shadow uh, that is with you all the time, to push it away from you, to deny its existence, to pretend it's not there, of course, as you did and so many others have done, is you create all these uh, what you think are barriers uh, to stay away from that. The problem is, of course, at the end of the day, the only way um, you can go forward is actually to integrate that shadow and no longer be afraid of it. And uh, instead, of, instead of trying to um, uh, suppress it, and deny its existence. And what happens is that if you uh, do that uh, when you're tired, when you're weak, uh, uh, it will show its ugly face. And and so for so many people then, uh, that uh, becomes a, a repeating pattern of, uh, frankly, uh, addiction in many ways because you fall back on that thing that you think supported you, and whether that's bulimia, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sex, whether it's drugs, that becomes your your, your fallback place. Um, I have a question for you, uh, just of off course. the side, and I we we've talked about it before. So uh, you were married at this time. Your husband was. was your husband was on a, a spiritual search. Uh, tell us uh, about uh, that. Sure. So, you know, I deeply believe that the universe sends us exactly what we need when we need it. And not everything falls into our preconceived ideas of how things are supposed to be, but we get what we need. And in retrospect, I realize this marriage served really two main purposes. One was it was extraordinarily healing for me. He was deeply, deeply compassionate, interested in, not scared off by the pain and the darkness that I was struggling with. And that's a huge thing for a 19, 20 year old guy to be able to go into such dark places with the woman he was dating. And he really had the, the incredible courage and depth and compassion to go to those places that enabled me to bring them to the light, you know, cause there's therapy is fantastic and wonderful. And yet Having that also in a relationship is really powerful and really beneficial. So it was it was of an extraordinary healing impact on me. And the other purpose was 
if it hadn't been for him, there's no chance in a million years I would have ended up in India. I traveled through Europe. I spent a lot of time in Europe, and that was sort of the way that I traveled. India was not a place I knew anything about that I had any real inclination to want to go to. Because he was on a spiritual path, though, we went. Now, even though things are exactly as they're meant to be, and in retrospect, we can see that, that doesn't mean that they're easy as we go through them. And it doesn't mean that we can see them as we go through them. You know, as we say, as you well know in psychology, we say hindsight is twenty twenty, but not foresight, not when you're going through it. So at the time, when I first found Paramarth Niketan Ashram, which is the ashram I live in, and when I first found Swami Chidananda Saraswatiji, who is the master I spoke about, who became my guru, who's the president of Paramarth Niketan Ashram, when I first found the ashram and I found Swamiji, I thought, oh, this is great. My husband's going to love this. I have found for him the ashram and the guru. And yet, it was very important to him and to his path that he find something on his own. A dynamic that we had between us did not permit him to embrace that which had already become mine. He really needed to, to discover and to find on his own. So he was not interested in the ashram. He was not interested in meeting the guru and in fact felt understandably very threatened by that because A, that's not what was supposed to happen. And B, for the first time in our entire marriage and for the first time since I was eight years old, I no longer was afraid of abandonment. When my biological father called me when I was eight and said, I never want to see you again, that provoked a terror of abandonment that I carried, of course, into my marriage. As you know, we carry these things until we deal with them and heal from them. And so I carried that. And the moment that I had that experience on the banks of the Ganges, that fear of abandonment just disappeared. And I no longer was afraid because I was so anchored and grounded and one with the divine that there just was no longer anything to be afraid of. And so when he said, I'm going up to the mountains and if you want to, you know, be with me, you'll come with me. That was something that a week earlier would have made me say, oh, yes, 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 of course, please don't leave me. I'm coming with you. And yet suddenly I said, okay, go. I'm moving into the ashram. And so it was definitely very threatening to him as an individual, to him as my husband, to our relationship. And I, at that time, was in the midst of such spiritual intoxication that I had just tears of ecstasy pouring down my eyes all the time. I mean, all I could say for weeks was just, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Oh my God, it's so beautiful oh my God, it's so beautiful. And there wasn't really a space in there for conflict and turmoil and individual psychological issues. And so I wasn't worried by what was going on between us. I just had faith that it would heal itself. It would smooth out that, okay, he's going to travel separately. I'm going to stay at the ashram. That's all okay. It hadn't occurred to me at that time that that was actually the beginning of the end of our marriage. But as it turned out, it was. And it was difficult for him. For me, because of the spiritual experiences that I had been given and the ecstasy in which I was living, there was no longer a fear of any kind of abandonment or separation. And so I remember just praying for him 
Like, please, God, take his pain. And there was a lot of pain for him, really, understandably. But by God's grace, 27 years later, we are we're friends. He's got a beautiful marriage. He's got beautiful children. He's got a beautiful life. And, and it didn't take 27 years, of course. It didn't take very long at all. And I feel really deeply grateful for the time that we had together and also for that internal GPS within each of us to know that ultimately being married to each other was not our highest, longest, fullest star. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think uh, in some ways uh, he had created a narrative, and I obviously I, I don't know him at all, and I'm presupposing I could be completely wrong, but he, he found a person who fulfilled what he needed to have, which was to be able to control, uh, to be the superior one in terms of uh, deciding and uh, uh, making the decisions, and then to have somebody who nominally looks up to him uh, and recognizes uh, whatever uh, his power is, and then uh, obediently go along. And of course, on some level, that's uh, very intoxicating uh, uh, to have, uh, and although I'm sure on a conscious level, it was not there at all, but to have somebody who does everything you ask, who uh, identifies your superiority in making decisions. And uh, probably I, I am uh, supposing that, frankly, you gave him the ganga, right? <laughs> Since that <laughs> you liberated him and uh, he had to go through his own pain and to recognize uh, the drivers of his behavior and how, in fact, at the end of the day, uh, they were neither helpful for him nor you. I think one thing was definitely true, which was I had really handed over the truth about me to him. I was very convinced that he understood me better than I understood myself and that he knew me better than I knew myself and that he was infinitely smarter than I was. And so as we went through process of my healing of the work that, you know, I was doing at that time, I really did defer to him in his, in his wisdom, not just about all things outside, but also about my own self. And it became really difficult but also a beautiful, beautiful experience and opportunity when throughout those months in India, when I was staying at Paramarth Nikathan in Rishikesh and he was traveling around, he would send me these faxes that basically told me how this was just another drug and this was just another new aspect of my addiction and this was not really spiritual experience. And habitually, I just believed him. And I remember going into Swamiji one day in tears. I had been there a couple of months and I was in tears. And I said, I'm so sorry, Swamiji, I have to leave. And he said, why? What do you mean? What happened? And I said, I've just been using you and using this ashram. And this is just like another drug for me. And it's just another part of my addiction. And it's really all wrong. And he looked at me like I was speaking gibberish. You know, sometimes in those car cartoons, you know, when you see it, you see a cartoon and somebody's speaking, but you see like their mouth is open, but you see the bubble over their head and it has just all of kind of the gibberish in it. That was how Swamiji was looking at me, like I was literally speaking gibberish. And finally I stop and he looks at me and he says, he says it, so you believe it, that's it. And the idea that he might say it, he being my husband, might say it and I wouldn't believe it was something that had never occurred to me. 
Of course I would believe it because he, he knew everything. And the simple question that Swamiji asked me, he says it, so you believe it, opened up this entire world of possibility of, oh my God, he might say something that I don't believe. He might say something that isn't actually true. Oh my God, my husband might not actually have the full and complete authority of wisdom of everything about me. And that was a whole brand new idea and thought to me. And in that moment, it freed me from the hold. Simply the question freed me from the hold. And Swamiji just kept looking at me incredulously. And he said, months of spiritual experiences on the one hand and one bitter husband on the other hand. And that's it. Like he just, he couldn't believe that I had so fully and completely handed over my agency. And so that was a really powerful moment of realizing, wow, I actually can trust myself. I actually can trust this internal compass, this internal GPS, this internal intuition, knowing, knowledge, truth. I don't have to rely on someone outside telling well, me about myself. You know, it's interesting because um, I think for people who have been damaged by some sort of trauma, physical, mental, um, they question themselves, they lose their confidence, and then somebody steps in who they give the attribution of wisdom, power, strength, and then it's really easy Daddy. to <laughs> it's really easy to give your agency away. And and what's so hard though is to see through that because as you know, I mean there are people who are trapped in these relationships and they're not even self aware about why they're there or what the actual dynamic is. And, and oftentimes these are codependent relationships where people stay together because each of them has their own issues and they're, uh, they think they're resolving them or they think that by being together it, it is actually helpful when obviously it, nothing could be further from the truth because in some ways uh, it's as if you accept that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the world's a dark, scary place and uh, uh, there's no possibility of sunlight unless the two of you are together. And, and, and that even comes down to people who are even physically violent or controlling. And so uh, I, I would just like to emphasize for anyone who's listening who's in these types of relationships uh, uh, that it's really, really important that you look at this and understand how the trauma you carry oftentimes is the driver behind so many of our own behaviors. You know, oftentimes we think that a choice we've made uh, is because uh, we really uh, are independently thinking about it, yet probably I would suggest that about 90% of our behavior has nothing to do with the present moment. It has to do with the baggage we're carrying. It could be with a smell that reminded us of something, or it could be uh, some other experience, but it's not on a conscious level. So just to emphasize, I think what you have done here in many ways is, you know, to uh, reclaim your agency and then understand uh, the immense power that each of us has when we're able to do that. You know, you talked about freedom or liberation, and uh, that's what this is, uh, where you now suddenly realize that within yourself, there's this immense, extraordinarily, extraordinary, powerful power, and uh, all you have to do is reclaim it. But of course, 
uh, the reclaimant, it could be challenging and take years. But it's an extraordinarily beautiful process, and everything that you've said is so deeply true and deeply profound. That's been exactly what my experience has been, is that it's about freedom. That power comes in freedom because in freedom, I'm letting go of the small story. And I'm then reclaiming the truth of who I am, which is one with the divine, which is one with the infinite, the eternal, the everything. And I am limited when I am just this physical body, this story, my skills, my abilities, my history, my experience, my this, my that, my money, my body, my... But when I realize that isn't who I am, I'm, I'm consciousness. And that consciousness, that divinity, whatever name we give it, whether we say soul, whether we say spirit, whether we say divinity, whether we say love, whether we say truth, whether we say awareness, whatever name we give to that which is not bounded and contained by the body, to that which doesn't change, when we realize we are that, well, then all of the power is there. Because then we are literally one with the divine by whatever name, however we connect with that divine power, but we're suddenly not separate from it. It's the drop merges back with the ocean experience. And when you have that, then it's not about my individual power as a draw. It's the awareness that, oh my God, I'm not this separate little being over here. I'm actually one with everything. And that's, you know, if you look at what we call mool mantras, meaning the foundational, the most fundamental mantras, we speak about aham brahmasmi. I am the divine. We talk about tat from asi, thou art that, or so hum, I am that. These are all just different ways of saying the same thing, which is I, you, each of us is not separate from it all. The universe, the divine, the creator, the creation. And this has been the experience of you know, mystics of so many religions. This is not, it's not unique to the Vedic tradition. It's just, I happen to know it in the Sanskrit way, but from my experience, but this is, this is true from the mystics of all of the different religions and paths, because there's not just one way to experience it, but it's about freeing ourselves of the story of the small I so that we can actually embrace the truth of that full eye. And that's that's what a lot of our spiritual practice is about, is letting go of the story. You know, when you meditate and the thoughts come and we simply return the awareness to the breath or to just spacious awareness, whatever we're meditating upon, that's a constant teaching over and over again. I am not the thought. I am not the thought. I'm just constantly bringing my attention back to that which I am, that consciousness, that awareness, that space in between the thoughts, the one who is aware that thinking is happening. No, I think that's uh, exactly the case. Of course, the challenge is uh, to really embrace that. And I think that's uh, one of the most difficult challenges, but fundamentally, when you are there, I would suggest that that's when you're uh, truly enlightened. Of course, when people say they're enlightened, everyone says, <laughs> turn in the opposite direction and run as fast as you can. <laughs> yes. But, but, <laughs> yes. Yes. but uh, it's funny because uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Tyson, he said, I think uh, 
we're all stardust, meaning we're all connected and we're part of a whole. But I think that's uh, absolutely correct. And in some ways, I think when we're able to, one, understand that everyone is suffering, two, that everyone has baggage, which oftentimes drives their behavior, and three, that when we are able to look at the other as ourselves, then that's when we truly, I think, understand the true nature of reality. Absolutely. And the true nature of compassion. I mean, that is that is the ground from which compassion stems. When we see the other as self, that's when pity and sympathy become compassion. That I, I'm not serving you because, hey, I'm the great humanitarian over here and you're the beggar over there. I'm not serving you because I'm the one who has and you're the one who doesn't. I'm serving you because you are self. Because there is no place I end and you begin because I see me in you. Or I see that same divine I connect with in you. And that's, that's the beautiful soil in which our trees and flowers of compassion blossom. Uh, actually, uh, just to throw out something on that note, uh, um, you've talked about uh, your own journey and uh, how that occurred. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the use of psychedelics in the sense that for a subset of people who, for whatever reason, have not been able to go beyond their trauma, uh, for that subset of people, uh, psychedelics seemingly uh, can be extraordinarily beneficial because through whatever that process is, it allows uh, many people to see the trauma and then let go of the trauma. Now, of course, the danger with this, and in some ways it's like having a guru, uh, the danger of this, unless it's guided by thoughtful people who not only prepare you, but also help you integrate, can be, uh, I think, extraordinarily powerful. Uh, but uh, I certainly would not suggest uh, doing this from an, a recreational perspective. And while some people think they're getting something from that, uh, in some ways it's an, an insult to the plant medicine uh, that it's being used that way versus what it has been used in traditional indigenous practices as a way uh, to see yourself and your place um, in the world. Your comment uh, actually uh, about the roots intertwined, I think, and things like this, I actually did um, uh, ayahuasca, or I'm sorry, iboga. And it's not because I had any interest in doing psychedelics because my own experience has been, and I think I'm sure you would agree, you can get there through either a spiritual practice or a meditative practice. But uh, the reason I ended up there uh, without too much of an explanation is because my wife was interested in these things, like she's interested in all things. And she had a friend who was connected to a person who do these guided type of experiences. And she signed up for it, which cost a few thousand dollars. And then as the time is coming, she says to me, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm afraid to do it. You have to do it. <laughs> So uh, I said, okay, because again, uh, from my perspective, these are potentially intellectually interesting experiences. And, and I think also if you're going to do these experiences, you can't have any fear because fear and anxiety actually will dictate how you have that experience. So I did this. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, so I did this and uh, no fear, uh, no anxiety. And one of the interesting exercises, uh, which relates to what you were saying, was uh, it asks you to think uh, 
of yourself as a tree, and it asks you to think of others around you. What tree would they be? Huh. Is the tree strong? Is it growing? And uh, for me, it was interesting because I saw myself as a redwood, but I saw everyone, <laughs> excuse me, I saw everyone as a redwood. Some were different heights, uh, some were more full than others, but everyone was a redwood. And it was interesting because from sort of sitting there watching this on an eye level, then I went up into the sky, if you will, and I saw this infinite uh, uh, grove of redwoods. And then I went under the ground and saw all of these intertwining roots. And it was actually an extraordinary uh, experience in the sense that it was a recognition that, one, we're all on different paths, but we're all the same and we're all connected. And I think uh, for me, that was uh, really uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, imagery of uh, reaffirming uh, the nature of the true nature of reality. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think that's the great power that psychedelics have. I mean, first of all, we know from a purely scientific standpoint that yes, actually that is how the redwood forest sustains itself is that the roots are all interlinked and interconnected beneath the ground. The roots are not super deep, interestingly, because the trees are so tall and so old, one would have expected that the trees would be really deep in the ground. But actually the secret to the resilience and the strength of the redwood forest is that the roots of every single redwood tree are interlinked with the roots of every other redwood tree. So on the one hand, scientifically, I love that anyway, because of the message it gives us about really where our, our strength comes from, where our power comes from. It's not just about my individual roots, but it's about how connected am I to the web of life, to the web of humanity, to the web of creation. The other aspect of that, though, regarding the psychedelics is I think that's really the power that psychedelics have, which is to show us a truth, but we then still have to walk to it. And I think that's where the work with psychedelics is so delicate because they can very easily become a crutch. I mean, it's so much easier to get there aided by, you know, as, as Ram Dass would say, better, better living through chemicals, you know, absolutely. Why not? If you can just get there through taking something, why do the work? So it becomes a crutch in many cases. And I think that's a big danger. But if we're using it just to show us the possibility, it's incredibly powerful, incredibly healing. You know, I, before going to India, before I was 25, I had an experience of taking psychedelics several times, but not in a situation where they were being treated with reverence, not in a situation with a guide or a shaman, but much more a late teens and early 20s, you know, Grateful Dead show, hippie, being with friends type of experience. And so while I always had had fun, I never had had very deep or powerful spiritual experiences on them. Then, of course, I went to India and all of my spiritual experiences came through grace, through spiritual gatherings, through meditation, through spiritual practices. But I know so, so, so many people for whom plant medicine has been a critical catalyst for them to heal, a critical catalyst for them to actually see that truth 
that for me, I was shown by grace standing on the banks of the Ganges of that that oneness of myself with the divine. So many people have that on psychedelics. And I think it's a, I mean, just a great, great tool, a great asset, as long as, as you say, it's done with a proper guide in the proper setting with the proper intention, not as a game, not as a toy, but that it's really used as a a tool for deep healing, for deep awareness, for deep truth. And I'm so glad to see the loosening of restrictions and the incredibly burgeoning field of research into plant medicine for healing. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I I had the pleasure of doing a podcast, I think, week before last with uh, Rick Doblin, who uh, uh, you know was at uh, Maps. Uh, discussing uh, his own experience, uh, and in fact, uh, you'll find this funny. He he said that his path to psychedelics uh, was a response to disappointment in his bar mitzvah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, for anybody listening, uh, you can find out why he said that uh, on the podcast. Well, listen, uh, what a joy and a delight uh, to be with you. And it's always such a pleasure. And uh, it's always interesting how um, sort of uh, uh, we see the world through uh, a very similar lens. Uh, We got there through a different path. But again, uh, in many ways, uh, it's the same path. So thank you so much. And uh, I love you. And it's always great to be with you. I love you so much, and it was such a joy to spend this time with you, and the fact that this time that we've been able to spend together now will ripple out and touch and benefit others feels like such a beautiful bonus of it, but the the joy comes from just being with you, and I'm so happy to have had this time together. I, and I promise you, I will come to Rishikesh. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Yes. It's so, so overdue. Yes. Uh, uh, you're embarrassing me now. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, I'll my stop. dear. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> love you. Again, thank you for being with us today. The Into the Magic Shop podcast can be found where you find your most popular podcasts, or you can find us at intothemagicshop.com.